Hey YouTube friends, I am so excited because today my wife is going to show you how she bakes her homemade sourdough bread. I've been asking her if I could make this video for a long time and she's kind of shy. She finally said yes. This is a delicious bread that we have been enjoying and I'm excited to share this experience with you today. So let's dig in. Let me preface this by saying I don't know what I'm doing. I'm figuring this out. I've been doing this over a year and I am still learning every time. The last two loaves before this one I made yesterday, what one was flat and one was hard as a rock. Even the chickens couldn't eat it. So I'm still learning, but I'll tell you what I do to get the loaves to work out. By the way, I'm not a YouTube wife and he's been begging me to do this for a long time and I told him no and then he kept begging me so I was like okay but you gotta wait till I put a bra on and so <laughs> I have a bra on today and we're gonna try to make sourdough together so first I have my starter that we fed last night um yep last night it was about down to here it had it was bubblier this morning but it should be active. That's another thing online. They always say, you want active starter. You want active starter. You want to do a float test. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. So I have fed and re found recipes that have unfed starter and I have made those before, but I have learned that you can't use hungry starter, which is different than unfed starter, which I learned. Um, unfed starter is just not as bubbly and active, but hungry starter is really watery and you haven't fed it in like two days. So you've got to feed hungry starter, but you can use unfed or active starter. I've never done a float test. Um, I don't really care either way. I'm going to get bread. It's going to be hard. It's going to be flat or it's going to be good. Either way we can eat it or the chickens can eat it. So I've learned that different flours, even different flowers that are the same type but different brands do differently with the same recipe. So I normally use white lily but one day I bought Pillsbury because it was on sale and not that it's a bad flower it just my bread was really dry so I don't know really scientifically what the difference is but there if you look online there's all stuff about hydration levels which I don't really understand completely and there's percentages and I don't do math. So I just make it and see what happens. So when I do find the recipe that I love, I'll continue to use that. But this recipe I found online is for an overnight, but you can also make it in one day. Uh, it has extra starter in it. I guess that's because it's gonna be an overnight ferment. So I'm gonna start by making that. So I'm going to, you have to have a scale. It, you don't have to, but it makes it, let me put my hair back. It makes it um, more accurate and they say you get better results with a scale. So I'm going to put my bowl on here and zero it out. I'm going to wash my hands. And I'm going to start with 150 grams of starter. This recipe seems to have a lot more starter than the other ones I've used, but I'm hoping I'll like that because I like the more sour sourdough so I'm hoping that will make this taste more sour sometimes it's hard to get exactly what they say oh I did it <laughs> so I got 150 grams of starter and then I need 285 grams of water and you have to use uh, any kind of filtered, purified, or distilled water, and you have to have it room temperature. So normally I would get it out of the refrigerator, but it's not working and it's a little cold. So you're not supposed to add cold water to the starter because it'll affect how it ferment or proofs. 
So if you do get cold water out of your fridge that's been purified, you'll want to warm it up. But I, I don't remember the exact temps, but I think it can't be over 95 degrees. So I do use this thermometer to test my water if I had to warm it up. But since this is room temperature, it's fine to add directly to the starter. And I'm going to put it in here just because it's easier to pour than from that big jug. So I'm going to zero this out again. And it's zero, so I'm going to pour until I get to 285. Oh well, that's good. All right, and you could also go ahead and add your flour in this bowl, but one time I did that and my, <clears throat> my dough was totally messed up, so I don't know if my scale is not quite high grade enough to have that much weight with the glass bowls and the flowers. So I always take this off, put another bowl on, and and um, zero it out again. <clears throat> and then add 500 grams of bread flour. Okay. That's close enough. And salt. And this recipe calls for nine grams of salt. What kind of salt? It says on the internet not to use iodized, like salt we pour on our food. They want you to use kosher salt, or I think you can use sea salt, but we have kosher. I guess since you're going by weight, instead of volume, it shouldn't matter. No, it don't matter. You that... just don't want the iodine in it. Right. And this, that's one reason why scale is better. I'm using 10 grams. We like our bread a little salty. Mm. Just like me. <laughs> All right. So I've read recipes that say you never add the salt to the water in the starter but I've done it. It seems like it mixes the salt in better. And I don't, it hasn't affected my bread. <clears throat> so I'm gonna mix this up a little bit and get that water and starter kind of mixed together. Let's see if this works. We're figuring this out together because I've never done it this recipe. I'm hoping to bake this whole loaf in one day. How many loaves do you bake a week? Usually one because it takes us a week to eat a loaf because mm -hmm. it's just the three of us. And it takes a lot of time so you've got to have, i got to have three days off at least to, or two days off at least to actually make it. <clears throat> So now I'm going to put this in here. It's really amazing that just starter, water, salt, and flour make something so yummy. I've read recipes that have olive oil in them too or other things, and you can add things. 
I still want to experiment with that, like adding herbs. I did it once and it was pretty good, but I want to do it more. Oh, it's messy. <clears throat> I think I'm going to have to get my hands in there. I'm going to wet my hands and kind of pinch this together. This recipe seems a little drier than some I've used, but how do you know when it's mixed properly? When all the flour is incorporated. <clears throat> can usually do this with a spoon, but it's kind of dry, so I'm just going to use my hands to get it all mixed in. Okay. So once you get the water, the flour, all that mixed in, you're supposed to let it sit for an hour and just let the flour absorb the liquid. It has a name, but I can't remember. And then you want to take a wet towel or you can use plastic wrap too but I found that these work really good because they stay wet and they don't have lint you don't I learned you don't want a towel that has lint on it <clears throat> so I'm gonna wet that so I think they are called a flour sack towel where'd you get it Robinson salvage <laughs> I also learned that you can't use, uh, you can't wash it with softener like you do your other kitchen towels. Because I did, I used a towel one day for bread that had been washed and there's some pieces, something on that. And with softener with all my other towels and it made the bread taste kind of like it had softener in it, so. The yeah. So we're going to set the timer for one hour and then come back. So I have this discard. What is discard? It's um, what we didn't use to make the bread. It's the leftover starter. So I need to feed it for the next time I want to make bread or just to keep it alive so that I can use it when I need it. So I usually put, and I use these wide mouth jars because I've learned you can stir easier with the wide mouth. And I like the way that it has the amount so I don't have to use dirty up measuring cups. So I pour in a half a cup of the starter. cup of water and you want to use distilled water or um, filtered water and I'm going to feed this with wheat flour just because it seems like it gets happier and bubblier with wheat flour and I also need to use this up because it's about to expire. And I usually just add enough flour to make a thick batter. I don't really measure the flour. Let me stir that. About the consistency of pancake batter? Like really thick pancake really batter. Really thick pancake batter. Yeah, that's good. It doesn't seem like the wheat flour. I think, I think the wheat flour soaks it up 
faster because when I use regular flour, I have to use a lot more flour. But I don't know. That might not be true. So I like to scrape the edges so I can see how it's bubbling and make sure it's happy and bubbling in there. And have a clean lid. And I put the lid on, but not like twisted down tight, tight, so it can have air, let air release. And then the other part of it, I just throw away, or you can make stuff with it, but I usually throw it away. How long have you had this starter? I'm not real sure. I think it's been a year and a half. I think I, I bought it online at Cultures for Health. And... I think I bought it during the pandemic because, you know, we couldn't do anything. <laughs> and I, when I first started it, it was intimidating. So I researched and researched because, you know, that's how I am. Yeah. I have to figure something out before I'm going to try it. And I looked and looked at YouTube videos, but all the scientific stuff about... You can't do this, you can't do that. Kind of had me nervous about it, but I've kind of learned that, I mean, if you mess it up, you still got something to eat, so. And it tastes good. Even if it's hard as a rock, even if it's tough, it has a good flavor either way. I also learned that when I first started my starter, it didn't really have a sour taste, and I had bought the San Francisco sourdough starter. And... I've learned, and I've also read this, that as your starter gets older, it has more of the sour taste. And that's true, because it has a lot more sour taste than it did a year ago. So that's nice. Hmm. You can put your starter in the refrigerator if you're not going to be making bread for a while. And I have some in the refrigerator that I probably need to feed. It's been in there for probably a month, and I haven't fed it. Um, and... That makes it less stressful because if you keep it on the counter, you're technically supposed to feed it every day. And we know that we don't have time for that. So sometimes it'll go three or four days and me not feed it. And it still stays alive. But if I was to not know that I'm not going to use it, I would put it in the refrigerator and then bring it out and let it get room temperature and then feed it. And then I can make bread the next day. So, and the bread dough has been sitting for an hour and now it's time to start what they call the stretching folds. And first I got to wet my hands. I've already washed them, but I'm going to wet them again. You got to have wet hands. So then you pull one side, fold it over the other, turn, pull one side, fold it over the other, turn. And you do this four turns. It helps from what I have understand to make the dough have like the little bubbles in it. I don't know what that is, a piece of black something. So then the dough, as you're stretching and turning, you can feel it kind of get tight on you. So. After four turns, I'm going to let it sit for another 30 minutes. And it's kind of cool today, the temperature in here. And I can tell the dough is kind of chilly feeling when I mess with it. So I think I'm going to turn the oven on proof and let it sit in the oven in between the stretching folds to help make it easier to stretch and fold. You don't have to do this. So I'm going to set my timer for 30 minutes and come back and you want to do three or four sets of stretch and fold. We're going to do our final stretch and fold. This is stretch and fold number four.
Okay. So now we leave it to proof and depending on the temperature of your house, depends on how long it proofs. It can be anywhere from four hours to 12 hours on the counter. I'm going to put it in the oven that's on a proofing temperature. So I'm guessing it'll probably take about four hours. You want it to double in size or near that. It's already doubled a little bit. Um, I think I'll put a, a dry erase mark to show where it's at so I can kind of tell that it's gotten higher. And then after it's proofed, we're going to shape it and put it in the Bannaton basket, which we'll talk about later. I guess I'll say it's about right there. <clears throat> the bread has been proofing in here for about two and a half hours and you can see that it has risen to the top of the bowl so I'm going to go ahead and shape it and put it in the Bannetton basket. Shaping is something that you can watch on YouTube and they make it look so easy, but it's really not. And I just do the best I can. So you want to flour your countertop. And then... Get your, put some, get your dough out of the bowl. It's nice and springy now. So then you do your folds one last time. And sometimes this is hard. You can see the air bubbles in the dough see all the air bubbles and that's a, supposed to be a good thing you don't want to knock all those air bubbles out so once you get it somewhat folded four times then they say to push it away and pull it to you until it forms a round tight ball but you also don't want to knock all the bubbles out. And then, once you get it in a nice ball like that, you take a Bannetton basket or a bowl that you have a dry towel in, and you either flour it or use rice flour, which is recommended because it doesn't... Um, I was using flour, but the flour was sticky, making the, the Bannetton basket sticky. So I've read that rice flour is better. So I made some rice flour from rice at home with our miller and it seems to work better. So I sprinkle rice flour in there, get it all cover in the bowl. What is a Bannetton basket? It's this wooden basket with a cloth fiber free cotton thing in it. So once you get your basket ready and you have your nice little ball, you take your bread and you turn it upside down in the basket and you pinch the bottom together to try to close up all that rough edges. I just want to try to make it pinch together so it doesn't split open from, I guess. So, having a hard time.
Could you do it in a bowl? Yeah, you can use a bowl with a dry towel in it. The same thing. So I'm gonna say that's good. And normally I would cover this with my wet towel and put it in the refrigerator overnight and bake it the next morning because I like the really sour bread and it seems like it's more sour if it ferments overnight. But because we're trying to finish this video, um, I can bake this today. So I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna cover this and let it sit for 30 minutes and just, um, I guess, rest in the basket. And these scraper things I have found, you can use them to like cut bread in half, but the best thing I found it for is to clean off the counter. Bread making is messy. I wanted to show this. This is the starter we fed this morning and you see how much it has risen and how bubbly it is and all those little air bubbles that means that the starter is happy. So, so this is what I cook my bread in. Um, there are ways to cook it without having this, but I've never tried it. So if you want to know how to do that, you'll have to look it up. But I found this cast iron Dutch oven at the antique store at the street and it was really cheap for cast iron. I think it was like $30, which is cheap. It was covered in rust and it had like inches of thick caked on nasty years of use stuff on it. But I spent probably two hours cleaning it and re-seasoning it. And now it has been very useful in bread making. You have to, this recipe said convection bake at 450, or no, 425. So a lot of the recipes recommend that you heat your cast iron in the oven while you're preheating your oven. So you can put the bread into a hot cast iron Dutch oven. So I'm gonna do that. And since I'm supposed to bake at 425, our oven automatically changes the temperature if you are convection baking. This really doesn't matter to y'all, but I have to type in 450 in order to, to convection bake at 425. So I'm going to put this in and let it warm up while the oven preheats. And while that's preheating and the oven is getting hot, our bread will be sitting here in the Bannerton basket and then we'll come back and I'll show you how to put it in. Our oven is preheated, preheated to 425 and we've let our dough rest for 30 minutes. So now I'm going to put it in the Dutch oven, but first I'm gonna put it on this parchment paper. So I put it over the bowl, flip it over. And then we have our loaf. And usually the bread is cold because I've got another refrigerator. So we'll see how this goes. But I have this um, razor blade thingy. Can't remember the name of it. And you're supposed to score the bread to help with the rice. So I'm just going to do like a... I'll just do one because it's kind of soft and I don't want to hmm. mess it up. So now I'm going to take out my hmm. Dutch oven. It's in here. And this thing is heavy and really, really hot. So. Take the lid off, take the bread, kind of just set it down in there. Put the lid back on. It doesn't really matter if the paper's sticking out. And then Okay, and then you 
This recipe says to bake it for 20 minutes with the lid on it. So I'll do that and I'll come check it. It's been 20 minutes, so I'm going to open the Dutch oven and see how the bread's going and if it's time to take the lid off. How's it smell? Mm, delicious. So before I... It's probably good. I usually try to see that it looks pretty much cooked, just kind of pale. And if, if it looked gooey or it wasn't um, browning at all, I would leave the lid on longer. But that looks good. So we're going to put it back in and cook it for another 20 to 25 minutes. I'm going to do 20 and then come back and check it. Okay. Looks done to me. It's dark crust on top. take it out of the pan because you don't want it to keep cooking so you just lift it up by the parchment paper and you have to let it cool for well it says usually about two hours but it has a, a nice hard crust and sometimes I accidentally burn the bottom but I didn't really burn it this time looks good We'll cut it when it cools and look at the inside. All right, we're going to cut this. I'm going to cut it down the middle so we can get a good picture of the inside. I didn't cut that very straight. Got bubble holes and it's very soft. Crunchy on the outside. Mm -mm, soft on the inside. Soft on the inside. Mm -hmm. Let's taste it. Is it pass? Mm hmm. It's good. Those are one of your better ones? Mm hmm. I think the moisture level is good on the inside. They don't recommend you seal it in a tight plastic bag or anything. You need to let it breathe a little bit. It'll get worse. I guess it'll get bad faster if you seal it up. Mm -hmm. So that's why he made me that bread keeper. Yeah. Just made a cutting board and cut a groove into it. And then we had a cake pan lid. So it sort of breathes a little bit, but you, uh, and then you can cut it on the cutting board as well. But you don't want to put it in there while it's hot. Yeah. You have to let it cool off first, right? Yeah. What happens otherwise? Well, you'll make the the crust will get it'll soft. get soft and moist. It won't have that chewy outside that's so good. Mm. What's really good is to put cinnamon and sugar and butter and toast it. Mm. It's really good. Yeah. Nothing like homemade bread. No, I want more. <laughs> <laughs> have fun. Play around. I. I've enjoyed the hobby over the last year. It's kind of interesting and gives me something to do. To try it too. I enjoy your hobby too. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks for watching, guys. Now, let's get out there and grow and be